In this video I'll show how to build a simple solid state Tesla coil that's powered by a 24 volt battery. It's a totally self-contained unit that'll fit on your coffee table or desk without tons of wires hanging out everywhere. I start off by winding the secondary on a 6 inch long section of 3 inch PVC pipe using 36 gauge magnet wire. There are 1200 turns on this coil. Next I add some epoxy while the coil is turning to ensure it spreads evenly and doesn't drip down. However, it turned out I was spinning a little too fast, and there was enough centrifugal force to cause the epoxy to bulge out in some areas, so I didn't quite get the perfect finish I hoped for, but it'll still offer decent protection against cuts and scratches, and a little bit of extra electrical insulation. Next, I made the toroidal top load with two 3D printed halves that I glued together and then covered in aluminum foil tape. After covering, I rolled over the tape with a solid steel ball to help flatten out any creases. To attach the top load, I printed this little cap for the coil that has a hex nut inside it which the toroid will be bolted to. Once that's done, I just connect it to the secondary with some foil tape. Note that this bit of wire has had the insulation sanded off of it. I ohm it out with the meter and the resistance is in the ballpark of what I expected so I know there's good electrical contact throughout and nothing is broken. Next I made this printed ring to hold the primary coil windings and then filled it with epoxy to provide some additional electrical insulation. In retrospect this was probably overkill though. Okay, a quick check shows that everything should fit together fine. I built this half bridge circuit to drive the secondary coil but the frequency was set manually without any feedback. It definitely worked but the results weren't very impressive. So I ditched that circuit and figured this would be an opportunity to try a Tesla coil circuit that I've been skeptical about for a while, the so-called Slayer Exciter. I soon discovered the Slayer part of the name was due to the fact that it's really good at killing MOSFETs. Okay, so you've probably seen a basic version of the circuit come up pretty often if you've done any research into solid state Tesla coils. In its most basic form, it's just a transformer that uses feedback from its secondary coil to drive the primary, but it does so at the resonant frequency of the secondary, so you can actually get some decently high voltage out of it with a really small input voltage. What's unique about this design is that rather than using a feedback transformer or an antenna, secondary feedback comes from a direct connection to the base of the secondary coil itself. You've got a resistor for biasing the transistor, a reverse protection diode, and a little high voltage discharge magically comes out of the secondary coil. Oh, and in case you're wondering how the secondary resonates without a capacitor, it relies on the stray capacitance relative to ground, which is usually a couple of picofarads. This part is no different than any other Tesla coil. We can swap out the BJT for a MOSFET in the design, but rather than a single resistor for bias current, you'll need a resistor divider or potentiometer to create a bias voltage on the gate, and in addition to a reverse protection diode, you'll also need an over voltage protection diode that will allow secondary current to flow into VCC if it exceeds VCC, which is a part of normal operation, so make sure your diodes can handle a bit of current. You can make the circuit even better by buffering the gate from the secondary current with some BJTs. This turns the gate on and off faster, but also gives you some flexibility to reduce the gate drive voltage with some more resistor dividers if you're running at an input voltage that's above what the MOSFET gate can handle. Okay, let's try it out. For the best arc size, I removed the top load and replaced it with a wire with a sharp point to provide a breakout. Let's try it at just 12 volts. Looks pretty promising so far, but my MOSFET is getting pretty hot, even with the big heatsink on it. Next, I added this 27 nanofarad cap across the drain and source pins of my FET and added this resistor to effectively make a divider on the transistor bases to avoid going over the maximum gate voltage of 20 volts at higher supply voltages. The diode is there to ensure the gate still discharges as quickly as possible. Let's give it a try at 25 volts. Pretty impressive result. This is 100% duty cycle, also known as a continuous wave Tesla coil, so it's putting out a ton of power and my Fed is getting extremely hot after just a few seconds of runtime. And then sure enough, it died. So I made a new driver board, but I modified the design just a little. First of all, I added a big 2 ohm 25 watt resistor in series with the capacitor connected to the drain pin of the FET. 
effectively making it a snubber. This dampens large spikes in voltage and current, which are a big contributor to the switching losses and MOSFET heating in this circuit. Also, I put three FETs in parallel to share the load a little better. I may have a huge heat sink, but the switching spikes were causing so much heating on the single FET that its temperature was probably exceeding the safe limit before the heat could even transfer from the body of the FET to the heat sink. This problem is exponentially reduced with multiple parallel FETs. Finally, I added a reverse protection diode which has a lower forward voltage than the body diodes of my FETs. For part of the cycle, there's a little bit of reverse current that would otherwise be taken up by the FETs and cause further heating, so this diode relieves them of that problem. Okay, let's try it out. I'll start off on 20 volts and ramp it up if everything goes okay. Smoke was coming from the big snubber resistor. Now obviously smoking a resistor is bad, but most of that heat would have otherwise gone into the FETs, so it was doing its job. It's a lot harder to destroy a resistor than it is to destroy a very delicate, sensitive semiconductor. Continuous wave operation creates a unique discharge, but it puts a tremendous strain on the driver circuit and doesn't give me the lightning shaped arcs I really want, so I'm going to add an interrupter to my board. This is just a 555 timer that pulls down the bases of the gate drive transistors. It runs at 60 Hz and about 70% duty cycle, meaning the coil will run at about 30% duty cycle. I set the timer to 60 Hz because I just wanted it to create that distinct mains hum sound even though it's battery powered. Current consumption has dropped in proportion to the lower duty cycle and the arcs have taken up a more sharp, jagged shape similar to lightning. The FETs also don't get too hot. I tried reattaching the top load after this, but the arcs weren't as impressive. So I guess I'll just stick with a pointy breakout. I replaced the little piece of copper wire serving as a breakout with a new cap on top of the coil and a big construction screw sticking out of the top which I sharpened the tip of. Sharper points concentrate electrical charges so they make for very efficient electrodes if you're trying to get arcs. Here I'm going to give the circuit 30 volts which is the maximum my power supply can put out. Everything seems to be working great, so I guess the next step is to box it all up in a nice metal enclosure. Personally I have a really bad habit of running batteries down too far and killing them, so I made this simple low voltage cutoff circuit. The circuit uses a comparator with a fixed reference voltage which goes high when the supply voltage goes below the reference. The high output is then used to pull down the gate drive portion of the coil driver. I dialed the potentiometer in to cause the cutoff to trip at about 22 volts which is just under 3.7 volts per cell on my 6 cell lithium battery. This is a pretty conservative cell voltage to stop at. Seems to be working as intended, so I'll continue boxing everything up. I'm adding these banana plugs for in case I ever want to power the coil from an external power supply. The power switch is being covered with a plastic sleeve. In a minute you'll see why this is important. Alright, here's the finished product. It came out pretty clean. It's compact and self-contained, so I can really take it anywhere. 
This would be the perfect thing for something like a science fair. I cleaned out this pasta jar and added a fitting on it so I could suck the air out with a vacuum pump. Let's see if I can turn it into a low budget plasma globe. Wow, that worked surprisingly well. Unfortunately, I had to keep it hooked up to the pump the whole time because the seal was really bad, but the effect was exactly the same as a plasma ball, but without using special gases like argon or neon. Capacitive coupling causes the arc to follow my finger. And here's why the plastic on the power switch was important. This thing will burn the hell out of your finger if you touch bare metal near it. You may think this is because the case isn't properly grounded, but that's not actually the reason. See, the coil outputs a very high voltage at a high frequency, around 300 kilohertz in this case. The higher the frequency an alternating current has, the lower its impedance through a capacitor, i.e. the more power it can transfer. Now, everything has a little bit of stray capacitance, also known as parasitic capacitance. For most situations in life, this amount is totally negligible. Maybe a few picofarads. Doesn't amount to anything that would actually cause you to see any effects. But when you're dealing with high voltage at a high frequency, suddenly those couple of picofarads are a path through which hundreds of watts can be transferred. In this case, the parasitic capacitance between my body and the coil's electrode is actually inducing a relatively large voltage on the surface of my skin, and since the case is effectively the ground side of the circuit, the large voltage on my skin discharges to it when my finger gets too close, hence the need for a plastic insulator over the metal power switch. At first it looked like I had a relatively minor burn that was just on the surface of my finger, but after two days it turned into a sore that looked like it went fairly deep below the skin and it hurt quite a bit. So be warned, even touching grounded objects can be dangerous if you're very close to a high voltage AC source at a very high frequency. The last thing I did was add a second switch in line with the power switch to avoid accidentally turning on the coil, and I added a push-pull fan pair to make sure the FETs inside stay nice and cool so that this thing will last a long time and serve as an interesting conversation piece on my coffee table. Okay, bye.